What movie have you seen most in your life? Anybody willing to shout it out? What's a movie that you've seen the most times? What? It's a Wonderful Life. It's a wonderful life. Yeah, Christmas probably gets up there. Others? Anyone else? Wizard, Wizard of Oz, Lord of the Rings. There you go. All right. Christmas Vacation's a good one. Okay, I'm going to... Ooh, good ones. Okay. If you had asked me that question, what movie have you seen the most 20 years ago, I would have named probably a sports movie, probably Hoosiers or Field of Dreams, maybe an 80s Brat Pack movie, if you've seen Breakfast Club, who's seen Breakfast Club, um, or Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But then I had Girls. Anybody have Girls? It's a whole thing, right? Um, I'm now a girl dad, and I can prove to you that I'm a girl dad, because I'm going to show you a clip from the movie that I have now seen the most times. <laughs> Let's see. Yes. I will not be singing it. You are welcome to sing along. <laughs> like I've ever known before. <laughs> you can feel it. Who knows this song? You can raise your hand if you know it. So you're hearing it in your head, right? That's good. I hear this song in my head all day, every day. All right, we'll pause it there. All right, Frozen, love is an open door. The movie stars two orphaned princesses. They're orphaned because it's a Disney movie, that's the rule. Um, Elsa and Anna. Uh, Elsa's the older sister, and she's to become queen. She has a hard-to-control superpower where she turns things into ice. Uh, this dangerous superpower has caused problems between her and Anna. It's kept them locked up. Anna, Anna, Anna. Locked up in the castle to hide this secret. Anna wants to escape the castle walls to find this love and adventure. On coronation day, Elsa becomes queen, and they open up the gates to the city. And on coronation day, Anna falls in love with a young prince named Hans. She is overjoyed. This romantic love is the open door. She's saved from being locked up in the castle. She finds love. She finds peace. This is her salvation. This is her way out. Love is an open door. Fall in love with the first good-looking guy you see. It's a great message for young women. <laughs> What could go wrong? Everything. Everything can go wrong. Uh, Hans is a fraud. He's using Anna to gain power. The open door of love gets slammed in her face. Anna ends up getting hit by ice by Elsa, and then she needs true love's kiss to help dethaw her and bring her back to health. Instead, Hans puts her in a room casts out the fire, shuts down the fire, leaves her in a freezing cold loom, and slams the door on her to die. Again, great stuff for kids. <laughs> Elsa, the older sister, she opens up the gates. There's an open door, an open door to the people. The people put their hope in their new queen. Things are going to be better. Things are going to be good. They're going to find the peace they're looking for, the goodness for the city they're looking for. What could go wrong? Put a young teenager in control of the whole city. Her ice power, who has volatile powers. Her ice powers go out of control. She brings eternal winter and ruins the town. In us, as humans, we have these longing hearts. We're looking for love. We're looking for peace in our lives. We're looking for salvation. We know things are off, and we're looking for things to get better. Uh, to fill the need that, that Anna has and that Elsa has, right? Uh, like Anna and Elsa, we open many, many doors, and each door lets us down in life, right? We knock on that romantic love door, 
Sometimes we knock on that political door, hoping that the right person will come along and make things better. We knock on the, the money door, or the fame door, or the our great nation door, or the self-help door, or the beauty door. And every door we knock on, we're hoping it'll give us love, we're hoping it'll give us something that we need. And each time we open that door, it might be good for a while, but eventually something lets us down. Eventually that thing we're longing for, hoping for, that would bring us love and peace ends up being shut in our face, or it ends up being a fraud like Hans. The, the message, though, of Christmas, the message of Christmas is that there is an open door to love. We keep opening false doors, hoping for something only one open door can provide. And the Christmas promise is that the child in the manger is the open door to real eternal love. Uh, We've heard that Christmas story read. Jesus is the new king, the rescuing king, the forever king is here. And tonight I'm going to simply reshare the part from that story, the part from the scriptures where the angels bust open the doors between heaven and earth and come to declare this good news of great joy for all the people. And as I share this story, I simply invite you to hear it and to be reminded or to hear for the first time or to just simply let you know that the love of God is an open door that is for you. And this story is in Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to pick it up in verse 8. In that region, so the child Jesus is born to, these, uh, to Mary and Joseph, and she, he's laid in a manger. In that region... There were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And verse 10 and verse 11, right there. These are the verses to memorize every word of this. Keep this with your heart forever, because here is the good news of Christmas. This is who Jesus is. He's three things. He's the Messiah from the city of David. He's Savior, and he's Lord. And I just want to take a few minutes for us to, to look at each of those. The open door, the Messiah is here, the one from the city of David. This word Messiah, it means king. The shepherds and all of Israel at this time, they were longing for a king. And, they, and the, the king they were longing for, they called the Messiah. Not just any king, but a special king was going to come from their people, which was going to be the ultimate king like their great king, David. They were right now oppressed under the Roman Empire. They knew that Rome was not an open door to peace or love. Interestingly enough, Caesar Augustus, who was reigning at the time, he declared that he was Lord. He declared that he was the Savior. He declared that he would bring peace to the Roman Empire. And he declared even that he was a son of God. But like Hans, he was a fraud. Most were under deep oppression and bondage, especially all of Israel at the time. Rome was a closed door to peace and freedom. And in our world tonight, the world still goes and knocks on all sorts of doors looking for a true leader, looking for a great king who will make things right. And the world is still full of evil folks who abuse power and who are frauds like like Augustus and like Hans and even queens like Elsa, who might mean well but will fail. The message of Christmas is that one true king has come through the people of Israel. And this is an essential part of the story, that this king is from the city of David. That matters. Because the Christian story, it starts with God, the creator. God makes us, God makes me and you, and we are made in his image. And we're to be co-rulers We're called to be kings and queens under him as the ultimate king. And the door when God made us, when God made this world, the door was meant to be wide open between God the Father and us. The door to love was supposed to be open vertically. And it was supposed to be wide open between us and one another. But as the story goes, we turn 
from God. Adam and Eve, they turn from God and they leave the garden and there is a door, there is a block between them. And everyone after them, right, we turn from God and then we start turning to other doors. And that's what Adam and Eve do. And as you unfold the story in the scriptures in Genesis and Exodus and the stories throughout the the first half of the Bible, it's people that close the door to God, turn away from God, and then start trying to open every other door to love, to sex, to money, to power, to nations, trying to find that love, trying to find that peace that only comes from that open door between God and mankind. But God does not give up. He loves the world. He plans to rescue the world. And he chooses a man named Abraham. And God promises to bless the world through Abraham and the people of Abraham, which is this people, Israel, these shepherds that we meet are Israelites. And Abraham and his people, Israel, are to be a light and a path to call all the nations back to God. God does not give up. He chooses a people and says, I want you to be my light back into this dark world to draw people back to me. And Abraham's called to be the father of many nations. And and after uh, twists and turns, Abraham's people do become a great nation called Israel. And they have a great king, a child from the city of Bethlehem, and his name is David. And King David and Israel, they're to be this light. They have God's law. They have God's ways. And they're supposed to show everyone the ways to God. They're supposed to be a light that draws the nations back to God and back to that open door. Unfortunately, like all the other nations, they're stuck in this brokenness, in this sin, in this bondage. King David was a great king, but even he ends up stealing another man's wife and he has that man murdered. And the leaders after King David, the people of God, the people of Israel, they begin to turn away from God too. These special people can't follow God but turn to wickedness and evil. They too open the wrong doors looking for love and life and peace instead of staying with their God. The end result of this is that no one does the good. All people, God's special people and then all the other nations like sheep go astray. They wander away from the love of God. And this is, this is all of us. But God keeps his promise. He will not give up. One day through Abraham and through David will come the true king, the Messiah. And that is Jesus who we meet in the manger. The one the shepherds have been waiting for, the one who can really be the true king, is here. God stays faithful to this world and to his people, even when everyone is faithless, even when everyone slams the door in God's face. The angels break in that Christmas night and say, no, the Messiah is here. God is staying faithful to us, even when we turn away from him and look to other things. So this Jesus, he is the Messiah, the anointed king. And he's also the savior. He is an open door to salvation for us. He is an ultimate door to salvation from us, from our ultimate enemies of sin and death. The message proclaimed that night is that we need salvation. Uh, The good news that night is a Savior has been born to us. The difficult truth that we have to recognize is we need a Savior. You need a Savior. I need a Savior. We need someone to deliver us from our bondage to sin and to death and to bring us back to God. And the message we get, the open door of love we get at Christmas is God so loves this world that he sends his son Jesus. That whoever believes in him and trusts him like Abraham did, right, and opens the door to him does not perish, but can have that eternal life. The message that gets proclaimed from the angels that night is one is coming to fight for us. One is coming to deal with the real problems in our lives. There is one who can save us from being dead in sin and suffering death. He's the great king. In the last picture of that Christmas promise book, right? It's got this beautiful story about the birth of Jesus. On the last page, it has four little pictures. Yes, this Jesus is a man. He is a carpenter and he teaches. But those last two panels, he's the one who comes as the baby, but then he comes ultimately to die on the cross. This child in the manger goes to the cross to fight 
and defeat our sins. Our sin is killed in his death. His death and resurrection have the power to overcome sin and death. He's the great king of love who fights for us. He's the great king of love who fights for you. He's the open door that saves you from death and hell and destruction. He remains faithful to us. The third thing, he is Lord. He's not just a human king who can save or win in a battle. The Savior is also the Lord. Not a Lord, the Lord. Which means he is the divine one and that his reign will be eternal. So he's not an earthly king who will be in charge for four years or until he dies and his son will take over and not be very good, right? No, he is the divine one and his reign is eternal. In the Old Testament, when they used that word Lord, uh, there were many names for God and people would say God and there, there were beliefs in lots of gods. But when, when the God of Israel uh, spoke to his servant Moses, he said, I am who I am. He said, I am Yahweh. I am the great I am. And it was translated Lord, and it's Lord in our Bibles, capital L-O-R-D. And when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, before Abraham was, I am. He's saying, the I am is with you. This great king, this great Messiah, this great one who comes to save is not just an earthly king or an earthly savior. God himself steps into our world, steps into the manger, steps into our life, and he is the one who is powerful enough and mighty enough to save and to restore and to open that door back between God and us. There's no earthly king or earthly person that can do it. God is the one who lowers himself. God is the one who who enters into our life and becomes Emmanuel, God, with us. God is the one who goes to the cross. God is the one who defeats sin and death and hell and is risen. This Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is Lord. He's the divine one who does what no human can do, but he becomes the human while being fully divine. And his kingdom will be the eternal kingdom that we join. This is what we've been reading for our Advent series. We've been meditating on this, this prophecy about Jesus. It says this in Isaiah 9. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The child is the king who saves, but look, he is the eternal Lord. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. He is the wonderful counselor. And we see in this passage, it's not a temporary kingdom. No, his kingdom will grow. His reign will grow. Endless peace will come from him. Real justice and mercy will reign with him eternally under his rule. We sang that song and Darren read from Revelation chapter 5. In that same book, it talks about Christ's return and the healing of the nations and the full restoration of all things. And it says God himself will be with mankind and he will wipe away every tear from every eye. We have the true king. The true king is proclaimed at Christmas. The faithful king. He is mighty to save. It is God himself, the Lord, who comes for us and loves us that deeply. And when that door swings open and we embrace his love, we join up with a kingdom that will have no end, whose authority will increase. There is an open door of love extended to you this Christmas. His love is an open door. To you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. How do we respond to this? The angels and the shepherds show us. First, we give glory to God. Verse 12, it says, this will be a sign for you. You'll find the child, the child wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. The child's the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior, the King, right? 
And suddenly, though, after they say this humble thing about this child king that's in the manger, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. I can't sing as well as them. I would, he is. <laughs> A second thing. Go to this Jesus. Run through this open door. He is good news for you. Verse 15, it says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went slowly, eventually, They went with haste. They went immediately. The news was too good. They ran to get to that open door to the child in the manger. They went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. Go to Jesus. His love is an open door. He is ready to receive you. He is mighty to save. He is the eternal King. He is good news of great joy for all kinds of people, including you. He is good news to this poor, engaged couple, Mary and Joseph, and to these shepherds watching their flocks by night. If you keep reading the Gospels, you'll see he's good news for the aunt and uncle, for for Elizabeth and Zachariah. He's good news for the wise men from foreign lands. He's good news for patient older folks in the temple that are Anna and Simeon. He's good news for tax collectors who betrayed their own people. He's good news for fishermen and soldiers and the sexually broken. He's good news for lunatics possessed by demons living among the dead. He's good news for grieving widows, for religious leaders, for young sick girls and older women suffering chronic illness. He's good news for the hated half-breed Samaritans. He's good news for men and women suffering with physical deformities that society saw as cursed by God. He's good news for sons who disgrace their fathers. He's good news for runaways. He's good news for eunuchs in foreign palaces who can't understand the scriptures. He's good news for captains in Caesar's army and wealthy businesswomen. He's good news for poor slave girls. He's good news for teenagers who fall asleep at a Bible study that went on too long. That's in the Bible. You can look up Acts. And he's good news for hardened jailers. He's even good news for Hulk Hogan. The Hulkster got baptized this week. He's good news for you. The love of Jesus is an open door to you. So there, there's, an open, uh, there's, a, there's an old German Christmas custom called Der Tannenbaum als Geheimnis. Hope nobody knows German, so that sounds like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Der Tannenbaum als Geheimnis. And this tradition is kind of an old German tradition. You keep the Christmas tree hidden away or locked in a room where the kids can't see it during Advent. So you decorate the tree all good. You make one room full of Christmas. You put all the presents under there. You make it beautiful, right? And then you keep it behind a door. And it's locked there until Christmas Eve. Then on Christmas Eve, you open the door for the kids to receive their presents. I want you to do something with me. I want you to imagine you're in your childhood home right now. And you're not in the room where that Christmas tree is. And the light's off. And all you can see is the glimmer under the door of the light from that Christmas tree. And you start hearing a knock. That door starts knocking, knocking for you to open that door and receive the gifts you receive on Christmas. There's a German pastor, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who uh, he suffered trying to be a follower of Jesus in Nazi Germany, and he actually died at the end of of the war for fighting against Hitler and running an underground seminary and all this other um, really powerful stuff. Uh, He describes the knocking of Christmas in this way. So hear these good words and hear them as your invitation to embrace the good news of Christmas. He says this, Your salvation is near. It is knocking at your door now. Can you hear it? 
It wants to make its way through all the rubble and hard stone of your life and your heart. He is coming. Christ is clearing his way toward you, toward your heart. He wants to take our hearts which have become so hard and soften them in obedience to him. He keeps calling to us during these very weeks of waiting, waiting for Christmas to tell us that he is coming, that he alone will rescue us from the prison of our existence out of our fear, our guilt, and our loneliness. Do you want his love and his salvation? That is the one great decisive question that Advent puts to us. Is there any remnant burning in us of longing, of recognition of what this salvation could mean? If not, then what do we want from Christmas? A little sentimentality? A little inward uplifting? A nice atmosphere? But if there is something in us that wants to know, that is set on fire by the good news of Christmas, something in us that believes these words proclaimed at Christmas, if we feel that once more, once more in our lives there could be a turning to God, to Christ, then why not just be obedient and listen and hear the word that's offered to us, called out to us, shouted in our ears, salvation is near, the king is near, don't you hear? Wait, wait, just a moment longer and you will hear the knocking grow louder and more insistent from hour to hour and from day to day. Then Christmas will come and we will be ready. God is coming to us, to you and to me. Christ the Savior is born. Let us not deceive ourselves. Christ is drawing near. His salvation is drawing near, whether you know it or not. The question is only, will we let it come in to us too? Or will we refuse its entry? Will we let ourselves be caught up in this moment, which is coming down to earth from heaven? Or will we close ourselves off from it? Christ is coming, with or without us. It is up to each of us to decide. I invite you to pray with me. And I'm going to invite Ellie and Gabby to come up and lead us in a prayer about opening the door to Christ. And I'm going to have them read it twice because there's two of them. (laughs) And then I'll lead us in prayer. There you go. I open the stable door. I kneel before the infant. I worship with the shepherd. I adore the Christ child. I give my love for Mary and Joseph. I wonder at the word made flesh. I am aware of the love of God. I sing glory of the angels. I offer my gifts to the wise men. I receive the living Lord. I hold him in my hands. I go on my way rejoicing, glorifying, and praising God. We hear it again, okay? I open the stable door. I kneel before the infant. I worship with the shepherd. I adore the Christ child. I give my love for Mary and Joseph. I wonder at the word made flesh. I'm aware of the love of God. I am glory with the angels. I have my gifts with the wise men. I receive my, the living Lord. I hold in my hands. I go on my rejoicing, glorifying and praising God. Amen. Good. Thank you, girls. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for your angels, your servants, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds who are an example of how to run to you. Lord, help us open that door. Help us run through that door that you have opened. Lord, we thank you and praise you. You are worthy. You are the one who comes to us in love. I pray for our hearts, Lord. Help us be aware of the love of God this night. Help us not seek sentimentality or a little uplifting, but help us seek your presence. Help us turn from all the doors that don't satisfy and walk through that door broken wide open by Emmanuel, the God who came to be with us. Emmanuel, the God who dies for us. The God who is risen. The God who is King and Savior and Lord. Lord, may we know you in the fullness of your love tonight. Draw us to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.